Now, I'd like to turn the stage over to Cassandra Binks. You may have already seen some of her YouTube videos based out of San Francisco. Fun fact, she doesn't cut her hair. I learned that. I didn't know you could do that. There's other ways. I have learned so many new tricks watching her YouTube videos. So I'd like to invite her on stage. And joining her is Dr. Vivian Shi. Vivian Shi is a dermatologist, and she is currently based out of Arizona, did her training at UC Davis. And she's also uh, actually a part of, she's one of the advisors on our Derm Vela team, and is very passionate about integrative medicine and dermatology. So I thought I'd invite them both up for a conversation. So welcome. First off, guys, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be here. Being the girl who had acne in school, who had to leave school because of how bad it was. Um, you know, being called pizza face, being called the exorcist, being asked if you even wash your face when in reality it was my morning and nighttime routine like a religion. Being on this stage and being an advocate for people with skin issues and acne and education on skincare is something that I never would have, I never even would have conceptualized. So I want to thank you first off for allowing me to be part of your journey, for spending this time here today, um, but also for the eternal love and support and the education. You know, because I think that as we all educate ourselves, it's the first step to empowering others. So also, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you. Thank you so much for taking time to, to talk with me. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be here. So this has been the biggest event in Sacramento for in history even. So I'm just really honored to be part of this. And thank you for sharing your story. And I think as a dermatologist, we always like to hear the patient's personal story. And so we can design an individualized plan that works for the patients. And how can we kind of approach the skincare from a holistic approach to bring skin health and lifestyle changes to kind of benefit from just beyond the skin, right? I think that's one of the hardest things for me. Um, when I had my acne at its worst, I saw over 24 dermatologists. Oh, wow. And I couldn't get that help. And I realized that even if a dermatologist cured my skin, I still have this depression. I still wouldn't go to see my parents in the morning without makeup on. I still wouldn't ask somebody out on a date because even if my skin were clear, I have these insecurities. So finding a practitioner who understands both the human and the medical element is really appreciated. And that being said, first off, I'd love to hear a little bit about your practice. And then second off, I actually had my audience submit a few questions just because sometimes it's hard to get a hold of a dermatologist or a doctor, or maybe we have the same questions and we've been afraid to answer or not have the words for them. So I'd love to ask a few of those to you as well. So first off, where do you practice and what is your specialty? So I'm a board certified dermatologist. Um, I practice at the University of Arizona in Tucson, where I'm a tenure track faculty. So um, my life is composed of seeing patients doing clinical research and translational research in the skin, and I teach residents and medical students. And I kind of approach skin in an integrative you know, fashion because integrative medicine is very big in Arizona, and a lot of what I see is eczema and inflammatory skin conditions, including acne and hydroadenitis. And I really kind of appreciate that we can't really treat skin disease without looking at the person's whole well-being, learning what are their struggles and actually what works for them. Because what may work for one person is completely different for another person. So um, I'm very lucky to be here with all of you to hear. I hope to meet all of you and learn all of your stories and see how we can move forward um, together working as a team. And if we have time, maybe we could even do like audience question and answer. I don't know if anyone's feeling brave. <laughs> Um, so the first yeah. question actually comes from a girl named Jessica. Uh, she's been my subscriber for quite a while, and she asks, why do some people get acne and some people don't? Why is she the only person in her family that has it? I can personally relate to that. My mom always told me when I was growing up, she was like, oh, honey, kids are just teasing you because they're jealous. You're tall. They wish they were tall. I was like, no, mom. I look like Lance Armstrong walked on my face. <laughs> And it was really hard for me because my mom had one pimple on her wedding day. My father didn't understand acne either. And being the only girl who was growing up in the house, I felt like I had no one to talk to. Why do some people get it and why do others escape it? I think we have to look at acne from both an outside in and inside out approach. 
So for example, like Jessica, she's the only one with acne in the family. It's quite possible that some of the, so we get acne because of a number of things. The first thing that happens in acne is the hair follicles gets plugged. It's very sticky within the hair follicles. And that's due to a number of factors, including hormonal changes and also the sensitivity of these little receptors within the hair follicles to make them more sensitive to environmental stimulations and hormonal changes. That is heavily influenced by our diet as well. So we now know with great evidence that certain dietary components can trigger acne. And these include um, dairy products such as whey and casein. And so everybody's diet is different, right? And we also found that skim milk can flare acne as well as red meat. Um, long chain fat, uh, brain chain fatty acids. And so these are the things that, you know, maybe the other family members aren't doing the same thing as Jessica. But boy, this is a very complicated disease. It's way more than skin deep. That makes so much sense. Uh, on a personal level, you probably look at me and you're like, Cassandra, you don't have acne. And I'm like, oh, Rudolph. No, but my acne has come a long way, and I have to attest to that. Uh, everyone has their own dietary choices. I personally went vegan after seeing one of those videos on YouTube that like you never want to watch, those animal ones. And I did it because I, I didn't feel right eating meat anymore. I never would have expected it to change my skin. But you give some great advice. You know, outside of genetics, there's environmental factors, there are dietary changes, allergies. Maybe Jessica's more stressed than everybody else. Jessica, talk to me, girl, what's going on? Um, but thank you for that answer. I know it's, it's so tough because if you're trying to, it's like being in battle, but you're not just fighting one team, you're fighting like 60 different armies because it could be the bacteria, it could be the hygiene, it could be the diet, it could be an allergy. But I'm, I'm glad we have you to help us figure it out. <laughs> The next question um, is from someone on vitiligo. She says that her interesting questions are based that, on the fact that she has not yet accepted this as being a condition that she has to deal with. Essentially, um, her skin color is changing. And while this is usually genetic, she doesn't understand what's causing it. She's hoping it's more treatable than others and wants to know about a topical or steroid cream or even a supplement. So uh, maybe I'll give a little bit of background on what vitiligo is. Yes. So vitiligo is a autoimmune condition where the body sees the melanocytes or pigment producing cells. We all have them, but the body sees it for some reason as something foreign and go ahead and tax it. Right? So when the body attacks the melan melanin producing cells, then the skin loses color and becomes a white patch. So this is what um, uh, uh, this person has. So there are different types of vitiligo, mainly categorized by distribution. Some of them are just focal patches. Some of them are segmental, right? Okay. Some of them only include the hands and feet. So um, there is some genetic component to it. There are cases and cohorts where multiple family members will have um, vitiligo. But more often than not, it's an isolated case. So you wonder whether there's a point mutation in this person. So we are in the embryonic stage, no pun intended, Ooh. to understand what the disease pathogenesis of vitiligo and how to treat it. But there has been some evidence showing that stress in the cellular level and also in the mental health level can trigger the onset of vitiligo, especially in post-pubertal children onset. So um, when a child gets vitiligo, it's more likely that they will repigment. But when an adult gets vitiligo as for the first time, for some reason, it's less likely for them to gain um, remission. Um, your other question is, what are some of the topical products that can be helpful with vitiligo? Um, Prescription-wise, in addition to low-potency topical steroid, because we want to decrease the inflammatory response, but there is a non-steroid prescription um, anti-inflammatory cream called the Tacrolimus. It has a cousin called the Pomecrolimus, which is a synthetic version. In addition to decreasing the little inflammation you have left to attack the mel melanocytes, it also has melanin regenerating potentials. We actually published a paper on this, actually. These are the patients, kids, actually, who get treated for eczema on the whole body. And for some reason, they're seeing more moles coming up. They're seeing more sun freckles coming up. So now we're starting to understand 
wait a minute, this group of medication called a calcineurin inhibitor actually has melanogenesis or melanin stimulating properties. So that together with some UV light exposure, the thought is to kind of kind of jump start the melanocytes again. That's so interesting. I know from a personal level, I would go out into the sun and I would tan, and those are those melanocytes working, but my brother would go out and he would just burn. But when it comes to somebody who's dealing with vitiligo, like you said, it's an autoimmune disease, which isn't just the skin, it's whole body. Yeah. And so certain dietary factors, you're saying certain stress factors can impact that. And then it sounds like there are some really cool topical alternatives that might be coming to the market. So that, that would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's also tough because, um, you know, as someone who's dealt with acne, I don't understand what it feels like to have vitiligo. But I could imagine, you know, seeing the color of my skin change every single day and in different patches or different patterns. Yeah. I could, from a beauty standpoint, I think I could see that very, very well. But I could also see that as being, um, you know, there's an air of uncertainty there which is really, really interesting. And if anybody has vitiligo and wants to tell me more about their experience, that's something I would really like online or in the audience. Um, secondly, we have someone named Emily Wood, and she wants to know what she can do besides popping pimples to reduce the redness and expedite the healing process. She knows not to pick, but she's like, I've got this on my chin, I want it gone. So I wanna start by saying, I'm a little biased, but I think every pimple deserves one squeeze. Just one. Just one. That's news I like to hear. If you can't get it out in one squeeze, you got to stop. Okay, that's the main point. And that's the hardest part to do. So, you know, we talked about what forms acne, right? The, the, the initial inciting event is when the hair follicle gets plugged. So if you mechanically try to extract that, the plug, to get rid of the plug so then the oils can still come out and then the bacteria is not brewing in there. If you can get it in one try, go for it. But the problem is, if you keep going at it, what happens is that you're actually creating permanent damage within the hair follicles, so the wall literally ruptures. And the wall ruptures, then all these foreign things that's not supposed to be outside the hair follicles start to create a ton of problems. And the body sees that, oh my god, this is supposed to stay within the hair follicle and not outside of it, so I'm going to come and gobble them up. And that creates a bigger and bigger pimple. And once that's, and you want to squeeze it some more when it yeah. gets, so it's a vicious cycle. And at the end of this, the body's trying to clean up all the mess. And that's when the scar forms, right? Was that the question initially? That, yes. <laughs> That was the initial question, and it makes total sense. I know that I'm a compulsive picker. I don't know why, but there's something about popping a pimple that made me feel like I at least did something. Like I get an immediate result, and I know it's so bad for me, but oh, I do it. Um, but think of pores in your skin as like little holes, and they can be filled with a bunch of stuff, and your hope is that life fills them with the good antioxidants, nutrients, fatty acids, and oils that you need to to go well, but sometimes mold, dirty water, stuff gets into those holes and that's what causes that bacteria and that plug and then we pop it and we are just like, we're basically ruining the holes and mixing them all together. Like here, have a swamp on your face, which explains the bacteria. Um, but Emily's, uh, the second part to her question is other than popping, so if that one pop didn't work, what could she do so that it's not as red or inflamed or there. There are certain things that you can do. Number one, redness is really accentuated by UV light. So first and foremost, please do sun protection with sunscreen, wear a hat when you're out. And I'm a big advocate of having people tint their windows, not to like all look like gangsters or anything, but there are clear tints that have broad spectrum UV blockage. So when you block the UV light, you get less post-inflammatory redness and brownness too. So that's number one. Number two, you want to try something that's more soothing on the face. We have shown that if you spray cold water on the face, the inflammation actually goes down. So it's not uncommon that I have people go get some mineral water, put it in the refrigerator, put it in a squirt bottle and just squirt, right? Um, and the other trick I tell my patients, not just for acne, but also for eczema patients, have you guys went to like an Asian restaurant or a Vietnamese restaurant where they had like spring roll that's rolled with rice paper? Okay. So that's really helpful. It's like a DIY mask that you can do. You simply cut the dry rice paper. It's really dry. It looks like a piece of dead skin, right? You cut them into the four quadrants of your face or whichever you wanted to treat. Um, you go ahead and you dip it in warm water. And it turns this really hard paper-like substance into a gelatinous sheet. 
and you go ahead and you just slap it onto the skin. And rice has been found to have antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory properties. And how do they know this? Is back then when the Japanese、um, workers were making soju and sake, which is rice wine, They were fermenting it, and what they found is like, wait a minute, how come their face looks so old, but their hands look so young? And it's because they're constantly, you know, their hands are being in touch with the rice brand and the rice. So that's how this came about, and so that's one other option.、Um, the other really good ingredient for acne is nicotinamide or niacinamide. B3, B3, exactly, B3.、Yep. It's been shown to decrease inflammatory uh, uh, response in acne or form lesions. So I love both oral nicotinamide and also topical nicotinamide too. That's so interesting. I think that what you say is really true. Beauty is from the inside out. So if you can use like B3 internally, or if you can use it topically, if that helps. Also, I love that idea about the rice paper. I know that when I go to like you know sushi restaurants, I always get the fresh spring rolls. I. Never even thought about putting that on my face. I'm so excited. Sorry, mom. 25 and still playing with my food. <laughs>、um, but thank you so much for answering that. I, I really appreciate it. And so then we do have another question, and this is from Aisha, and she specifically talks about products. So like those natural tips are in our skincare. She wants to know what should she avoid for her skin and/or altogether for acne and aging. Because one of the biggest problems that I found is that when I use an acne treatment, it might dry out my skin and it might help the acne a little. But then I feel like it gives me more wrinkles or more dryness or sets me up for aging. So she wants to know. Natural rice paper or stuff you get over the counter. What are some ingredients that you might want to avoid? So、um, for acne skin, it's it's very tricky because unlike rosacea skin or eczema skin, acne skin tends to be pretty tough. They're oily. They can take in a lot. But most of the acne products over the counter or by prescription works by drying the oil glands. They work by exfoliating the top layer of the skin, right? So that's a drying agent. So if you have acne and sensitive skin, then like myself, then you're unlucky. So you have to be more strategic of what you do. The key is to find something that actually works for you. A very gentle wash, and if you can, try to avoid really harsh dermabrasion brush every day, because sometimes you actually create. Um, trauma to the hair follicles, and you know we're, we're all trying to clean our pores really diligently. I get it, but sometimes we overdo it, and that actually causes acne or form lesions.、Um, the other thing that I have found very helpful for my patients、um, is to avoid synthetic dyes in their acne products.、Um, avoid very thick products such as petrolatum, which is basically the、um, main substitute, substi-、uh, the, the component in Vaseline. Um, something like zinc oxide is sometimes used in、um, sunscreen, but sometimes it can get really pasty and really clog your pores too. Other things you want to try to avoid are that strong sensitizers, such as preservatives. There's an agent called MIT that is has a very long chemical name, but if you Google MIT, it'll show up. It's commonly found in wipes. And pres- it's like a preservative. That's the allergen of the year in the American Contact Derm Society. So it takes a little bit of time to look over the ingredients list and kind of go over that with your practitioner to see what's most suitable for your skin. It goes back to that advice of like turn over your skincare labels、exactly. and just look at them.、Yeah. If you don't understand something, you can Google it. But it's like if you care about what goes into your body and what you're eating, why not care about what's on those labels as well? And you know what? That's what Google's great for. You want to also always moisturize your skin first before you apply the acne product. A lot of our folks, we wanted to soak in the acne product as much as we can, but that's when you start to get the drying effect. So I typically recommend wash your face, pat it dry, put on the moisturizer immediately, then wait for it to soak in for a few minutes, then apply your acne product. So you'll get the the benefit of the acne medication without the drying and irritating effects. Sounds better to me. <laughs> Um, the last question that I do have is from Maria,、okay. and she wants to know about what good OTC over-the-counter products that you could get at a drugstore are good for acne and rosacea-prone skin.、Yeah. And she doesn't understand the cause of her rosacea. She knows he ha- she has acne. She knows her face gets red. But is this rosacea genetic、right. for her? Is it exacerbated? Like, what's what's going on with her skin? 
So this is a very interesting question because I've had an, a lot of adult patients, both men and women, that have, quote, acne rosacea. Do they have acne or do they have rosacea? So um, unlike, uh, unlike acne, rosacea doesn't start with whiteheads and blackheads. So take a look at your skin to see if you have those components. And typically rosacea tend to be more focused on the center of the face and then in between the eyebrows and the chin. Then you have more broken blood vessels. Versus if you're an adult with acne, it tend to be more in the jawline, the hormonal acne component. There's a number of really good uh, medications that are now over the counter that used to be prescription. One of them is the adapalene. Um, adapalene gel. Adapalene gel, right. That used to be prescription, and now the 0.1% gel is over the counter. And it's a synthetic cousin of retinoid or tretinoin and it's a little milder but for those who tend to have more whiteheads and blackheads that's a really good option um, other things we talk about is nicotinamide right um, and then there are vitamin uh, e oil which is okay. really really Perfect. good um, it has anti inflam uh, antioxidative properties as well but you want to pick something that's less greasy and pore clogging by the way if you can give me half a minute i'll tell you what comedogenicity actually means so um, we all look at bottles, we look at makeup, it says, oh, this is non-comedogenic, it won't plug your pores. But guess what? There's actually no standardized test to test for comedogenicity. Um, we have a list of ingredients that tend, we, we think might be more uh, pore clogging or not, but currently, um, it, historically, they're actually tested on the foot pad of a rabbit, which is very different than our face. Uh, and more recently, they're testing on the back of an African-American man, which is also not, it, it doesn't represent the full, you know, diversity of our patients who are typically women and applying these products on the face. So take the word non-comedogenic with a grain of salt. Yeah. That's so interesting. Through my own personal research and my studies in school, uh, it's shocking to me how much research uh, is swayed by s statistics. And even though I've been in beauty for like, God, going on 10 or 11 years now, I didn't even know that. And I always wondered why something would say non-comedogenic. I was like, oh, it won't cause comedones. It won't break me out. But they're telling me that I can sleep in this. And then I do, and then I break out. <laughs> don't sleep in your makeup. Yeah. <laughs> no, but thank you for answering that. And just on a personal note, um, you also mentioned using oils. And being someone who grew up with oily skin, Rihanna, my forehead shined bright like a diamond, <laughs> okay? I always avoided oily products because I thought I had to stay away from them. Those were gonna cause my acne. But it wasn't until I started incorporating a couple selective oils such as jojoba or squalene, which are kind of similar to the skin naturally but have better antioxidants that I realized this isn't breaking me out, this is helping. Can you explain the whole oil conundrum? Should people with acne use it or stay away from it? So it's a really good question. We don't know at this point whether certain natural oils will clog the pores or not. And most of the time, if you find a product over the counter, they're not just going to have in one ingredient, right? So even if a researcher or a lab were to look at one ingredient, when you buy a formula in a bottle, it has 20 other things. What is the final comedogenic potential of the entire bottle? We don't know. And maybe some companies will have done research on that, but these informations are not public. You bring up jojoba oil, I'm so glad you did. Actually, jojoba oil contains a very high percentage of wax or squalene, which as you mentioned is unique to human sebum, but it's found in nature. So actually most closely mimic our natural oil. So those with raw dry skin on a scalp or sort of on the face, that's a really good option. And we recently published a study comparing jojoba oil with sunflower seed oil and coconut oil, and we found that they're equally effective and in improving the skin barrier function. And they're preferred over the more sticky Vaseline, which is petrolatum. Vaseline, yeah, that's literally petroleum plastic-based stuff. When I was first going to school and I found that out, I was like, why am I putting this on my skin? Yeah, so some of the <laughs> alternative for, that, uh, for petrolatum now is a fractionated petrolatum, which is less sticky and less waxy. And um, there's a Burt's Bee product, who, you know, beeswax is an alternative, more natural option for petrolatum as well. And does the same thing by nourishing the skin and forming a barrier to prevent things, bad things from coming in and nutrients and waters from escaping out. 
Thank you so much it's for helping pleasure. break that down. So when it comes to skin science, do we have time to take a couple of audience questions? Sure. Do you think? I mean, I don't, do we have time Does for anybody that? have a specific question? Hi, sweetheart. How's it going? <laughs> Is it on? Technology is great when it works. Yes. <laughs> um, what are some ways to learn more about ingredients um, or like trying to understand them so that you know what is good for your skin type or not? That's such a great question. Um, when it comes to knowing what ingredients are safe for your skin or how to find out more about ingredients, it's like a wild goose chase because media tells us one thing, companies tell us the other thing, and then my grandma sits over here and tells me to put orange peels on my face. Um, I'd love to let you give your advice in that in a second, um, but for me personally, as someone who's literally been like, I guess a child of the internet for 15 years, when I was first starting to research my acne, I couldn't ask my mom anything, so I literally went on Google. And since then, um, both being able to learn from the internet, from people's personal experiences, and then also being able to share mine, I've personally found that vloggers, bloggers, and then people who share their experience can be really helpful. And then there are medical articles that are actually public online. PubMed is uh, you know, a database of those. You can also search for them online. You can search for a certain ingredient and just say medical study behind that, and you can find out more about that ingredient. And then there is the EWG, the Environmental Working Group. They actually have a toxicity list of different chemicals. And as a blogger, before I make recommendations to people, I usually like to check that to make sure, is there anything in here that would cause somebody to break out? Is there a chemical that I don't know about yet? Um, but again, this is your beauty. This is your face. And I don't think we all realize also um, what an impact, both positive or negative, our products can have on that. So when it comes to doing your research, it's fun, it's exciting, and it's essential. Whereas Netflix will always be there, it can wait. But what about you? As a doctor, what would you recommend for people to learn a little bit more about ingredients? So um, my recommendation is what may be a sensitizer or irritating compound for one person may not be for another. And you may be using the exact same lipstick for 20 years, same brand, same line, and you may never have a problem with it and suddenly you develop an allergy to it. It's because as we become more mature, okay, not older, just more mature, um, our immune system becomes smarter. It's able to react to a number of things that it didn't before, that's number one. And two, if you've been using a product, if the manufacturer decides to change one single compound in a list of 100, they probably won't call their consumers and let them know, right? So you can develop an allergy from what you think is the same product you know, that you've been using for a long time. Um, the American Contact Derm Society, ACDS, published a list of very allergenic compounds, and this is public information. So go on their website and check it out. But my biggest recommendation is, if you're gonna buy a new product, try one at a time. And don't try it on your face first. Try it in your inner thigh or inner arm first, where the skin is still pretty thin and sensitive, but if you end up getting a reaction, at least if it's not for everybody to see and when you apply it you want to keep applying it and wait about 48 hours to 72 hours for a reaction to occur if you wanted to be super safe do it for a week and if your skin is not reacting to it you're probably good to go that is great advice i know that when i was young you know i would get a paycheck and i was like acne products fix me but i would literally try five new things at the same time and it came to the point where I realized you have to think like a scientist. A scientist isolates their variables. They're not gonna throw 50 things into a pot. They're gonna add one at a time and see what happens. So if they see a change, they know which product did that. And I realized, Cassandra, little Cassandra, you were doing everything wrong. You were picking your pimples, you were sleeping in your makeup, you're using 10 new products at a time. So when you get a new product and you're excited about it, take her advice and test it somewhere nonchalant first. And then make sure that you're adding things to your routine once at a time. Also, I know that there's men out there too, but I think this is super important for girls. We have hormonal cycles that actually show up in our skin. You ever notice that you get breakouts around a certain time of the month, right? That happens to me all the time. And when I was younger, I used to try a new acne product, give it a week or two weeks. And I was like, oh my God, it's breaking me out. No, it was just biology knocking on my door. 
<laughs> but it's one of those things that is girls, we need to test a product for a good 28 days to know how our hormonal cycles are actually responding. Was it stress? Was it our periods? Or is it actually the product that's doing something? And as a beauty blogger, my blog is built on honesty, but it has been tough because there's so many products out there. But if I am going to personally try a product and actually use it on my skin, I can't use it for less than 28 days. Meaning, I can only try 12 products on my face every single year. So as a beauty blogger, it's hard. I have to look at the ingredients, I have to know those things. But that's something that you need to know as well, because that's our biology. And if you're constantly bombarding it with things, you never know, you're never going to know what does or doesn't work. That's really well so put, yeah. Thank you for making that point, because a lot of times when we see patients, we start a regimen or we give a medication, and sometimes um, you know, our patients are very ambitious in improving their skin. I'll get a call in two weeks, like, doctor, it's not working, it's getting worse. And like you said, it's part of the cycle or the medication just takes about you know, two to three months to really start to work. And that's part of the cell cycle, too. Yeah. Fun times with biology in your face. Does anybody else have a question? perhaps on anti-aging or on acne. Yes, could we give her a microphone? Hi, I, I'm wanting to switch from a chemical sunscreen to a physical because of effects on the environment. And I've tried a few and they have that white cast to them and they don't blend well with makeup. And is there any, are there any that are better than others or? So I would love to speak on this. I actually went to Hawaii for reef conservation this year which was first off super cool and fun, but it was so informative. And as someone with acne prone skin, I care about ingredients, but I never stopped to think about what my sunscreen, me protecting my skin, could actually be doing to the environment or to my skin. So when it comes down to it, there are two basic types of sunscreen, which is mineral and physical or chemical. And the way it works is that you apply these all to your skin, but the chemical ones essentially are like sponges. They sit on the skin, but they absorb the UV light. And they don't let it into your skin, but they kind of keep it right there in that molecule. Physical ones are different. The actual molecule um, is, or the, uh, it's shaped a little bit more like a piece of glass or a mirror. So it sits on top of the skin, and as light comes, it reflects. Sorry. <laughs> but it reflects so that that way your skin doesn't absorb it. Now the problem with that is that sometimes that reflection can give us that white cast. Again, anything that ends in an O-N-E, oxybenzone, avobenzone, if it ends in one, not safe for the reefs. But if it's a dioxide, titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, that's safe for the reefs, but it might give us that flashback. That being said, I have found, I would say two products that I really can attest to personally. I have to say that I'm vegan, so I don't use products that, um, that don't align with my cruelty-free ideas. But I personally really love Juice Beauty, they're organic, and then Kula Sunscreen. They're a little bit more, um, they're not as natural, but they're really effective. Now, I would love to know from you as a doctor, what clinical recommendations do you have? What other ideas do you have? And like she said, how can we protect our skin and the planet without looking like Casper? One, pick a sunscreen that you will actually use. Pick something that's not gonna pick, pick up your makeup. Otherwise, the compliance rate goes down. I typically recommend, if you, you did a really good job summarizing the ingredients, but these, I'm just gonna add with some practical tips. So rather than using a sunscreen that's contained in your makeup or part of your moisturizer, spend the time doing the moisturizer, then applying the sunscreen afterwards because you're getting very little sunscreens, SPF 15 or 30 at the most, that's already part of the moisturizer. That's just not enough. So spend the time, do them separately, and pick one that you will like. Um, some of them are micronized zinc oxide too, that's less cakey, and they have tinted formulas as well. And there's even makeups that have minerals inside that can help um, you just brush it on and reapply throughout the day. Yep. Thank you, dear. So it looks like we're running a little short on time, but I just wanted to say thank you guys for being here. I really truly believe that education is empowerment, and what you do for your students, what you do for people here and online is really appreciated. And I think that just taking the step to ask those questions, to seek those answers, it helps us be more educated consumers, but it also helps us to have something to give to the world. I mean, I'll say something that I never thought that I would have said but I'm glad that I suffered with severe chronic cystic acne for over 15 years of my life. I'm glad that I was depressed and suicidal and hurting because if it weren't for that, I wouldn't have started a blog where I reached out for help. 
I wouldn't have had the opportunity to connect to other people with acne who were feeling the exact same way. If it weren't for my acne, I would not know my purpose in life. I wouldn't have the opportunity to sit here and talk to you and to connect with you and to learn about what you're doing to change this world. So on a personal level, thank you. And remember that whatever it is you're going through, there's always a silver lining that doesn't have to flash back. <laughs> Your skin you looks so beautiful. Much. Thank you guys. We'll, we'll see you on Dermveda. They have a lot of really um, exciting blog articles as well, written by doctors and naturopaths that can really guide you as well. Personally speaking, a shameless self-promotion, I have a lot of videos online. My name is Cassandra Bankson, like bank son, ad advice you would give to your kid, put your money in the bank, son. Um, but I try my best to educate on the reasoning why when it comes to products and ingredients. And then, you know, also doing that extra step of research, asking a friend or family member, talking to your doctor and actually bringing a product in. Education is empowerment and with these little devices, the world is at your fingertips. So have a great one, guys. Thank you so much.